All right. Hello, comrades. It is so wonderful to see your beautiful faces. Um, please turn on your video if you can, because just it's nice to see everyone. Um, <clears throat> and um, we like to pump people up. So as people are speaking, um, if you want to give, there's some reaction emojis you could give in the bottom, or you can do like your hands like this. Um, just, you know, support your fellow comrades. Um, and so first, we, um, did we pop the, yeah, let me pop the uh, agenda in here. Um, so that's the agenda with all the links for getting involved and everything for tonight's meeting. Um, and we're going to kick off with the chair's report. I'm Leah. I'm one of your co-chairs. And um, so here we are. Early voting just ended in the race that we're in right now, like literally four minutes ago. Um, and as a chapter uh, for this election, as you probably know, we voted to run campaigns against two propositions, uh, no on Prop F, which is the strong mayor proposition, and the much bigger fight, which many of y'all have been working hard on, is uh, the campaign against Prop B, which criminalizes homelessness and poverty. And we'll hear more from that campaign soon about where they're at in the campaign and um, what kind of help they need going forward because um, your last and only chance to vote now in the election against these two terrible propositions is Saturday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So there's a bunch of work we've got to do to get the vote out leading up to Saturday. And then on Sunday, we'll gather together to celebrate. Um, first, we'll be celebrating defeating these awful propositions because we're gonna work our asses off to defeat them, of course. And second, we're celebrating May Day, even though we're actually celebrating on the 2nd of May um, because May Day is International Workers' Day. and we'll be celebrating labor um, because the cause of labor is the hope of the world. We're going to hear from our labor branch more about that shortly tonight as well. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is that I see our May Day celebration as kind of a kickoff of a new chapter, um, a new period for our chapter. We are going to pick some work and some fights that are not only important, but they will build up the chapter and ultimately prepare us to fight for the Texas legislature. Because this whole pattern where every two years the Texas legislature decides to get up off their asses and go to work and just make everything in the state a little or a lot worse, um, this nonsense is going to end. Um, this pattern where Texas Republicans institute the prescribed legislation from the Kochs and the Alex and the Heritage Foundations and various other hate groups, um, like how they're coming after trans kids this year and how they keep making it harder and harder every year to vote. Um, they don't like it when people vote. <laughs> and crucially, how they target Austin and other big cities and overturn all our major wins. Um, and also how Democrats help them block legal cannabis and keep promising this blue wave that never comes. Um, that's gonna end because we are going to end it, us. Um, because I believe if we start now and we decide to run some class struggle campaigns for the Texas legislature, we'll win. And if we win those seats and we get socialists in there fighting and speaking up for the working class, we're gonna win more seats. So how the hell are we gonna do that? Um, we need a candidate to run a campaign in a district on a slate with other DSA candidates across the state in an election year. 2022 might be too soon. So we might be looking at 2024, which is good. It gives us some time to prepare. Um, the electoral committee has been doing a lot of work um, and a lot of awesome work on district research in coordination with other Texas chapters. Um, so check out the electoral committee for more of that work. And most importantly, in order to have the right candidate and an Austin DSA chapter ready to win that campaign, we need to recruit from the multiracial working class. Um, we need to learn how to be organizers and we need to practice being organizers. And how do we do that? We're recruiting, we're, organized, we're doing organizer training and unions. So not just recruiting your most left friend, which is 
also, you know, just generally good, but the more importantly, the hard kind of recruiting where we never organize an event without gathering everyone's information. We do tabling, we show up, we don't just talk to our friends at events, but we talk to engage with everyone about how DSA, about DSA and how important it is. And um, we're going to learn how to have those conversations. And I cannot stress this enough. We are going to see every project and campaign as first and foremost, a way to teach people organizing and recruit people to DSA. So for example, some of the work coming up, we're going to continue building up the labor branch, uh, fighting for the PRO Act, supporting local unions in their fights. And we need to keep recruiting from our unions and looking for those organic leaders that Jane McAlevey talks about in No Shortcuts, because this is where I'm expecting to find our candidates. And so the labor branch is a good way to get involved there. Um, we're going to prepare for and support police protests and recruit from them. Um, we put together a small working group on the leadership committee to start planning and coordinating with our Austin is Safer When partners and the defund decrim resolution that we passed at our convention in January will cover our work there. And we'll be sharing more updates on that soon. And we're looking at ways our chapter can help build up local YDSA chapters. Um, Jake is putting together a possible resolution for this to, for us to help mentor and establish YDSA chapters. So reach out to him if you're interested in that. And just to reiterate it, going forward, every campaign, every piece of work we do will build up the chapter, recruit to the chapter and practice organizing. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Richie Floyd is a DSA member and union member running for St. Pete, Florida City Council. And he's running an awesome campaign about building a city that works for the people. And it has one of my favorite taglines, a better St. Pete is possible. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over. Richie, are you there? Yeah, absolutely. I'm here. Uh, I appreciate that wonderful introduction. And uh, actually, everything you just said touches on a lot of the things that I'm about to talk about. So I'm really excited for everything. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to say is thank you for having me. Um, I really like have looked to this chapter as inspiration. Austin has done a great job. Um, one of the things that came up uh, before I was ever doing this, I was a DSA member. I had been co-chair of uh, Pinellas DSA. Um, Pinellas County, Florida. It's where St. Petersburg and Clearwater are just right across Tampa Bay from Tampa. Uh, I was co-chair and then organizer for the chapter um, before I ran. And we had a, you know, DSA for Bernie campaign here. And it was really inspiring to see the DSA for Bernie campaign in Austin. Uh, I called even some of the members on this call to be like, how are y'all doing that? It was so impressive. Uh, so I uh, just really wanted to say thank you and like it looks like y'all are doing really great work in the South and that's an amazing thing and so keep it up. Uh, you're an inspiration to all of us across the South. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my campaign and sort of how we're trying to do all of those things that were just described. Uh, it's a DSA campaign like through and through. Uh, everyone that works on it is a DSA member. Um, everybody that shows up gets asked to join DSA. Uh, basically like you know, we're run, um, we have a, a structure, sim the campaign has a structure similar to a DSA chapters. And we uh, are doing the same things that you've seen DSA campaigns do, you know, raise as much money as we can from small dollar donations, uh, knock on as many doors as we possibly can, call as many voters as we possibly can, and really bring our message straight to people. Um, and so, you know, that's the first thing. Um, but really, what does that mean practically is like, um, you know, when you use DSA members to do the work of a campaign, they gain valuable skills, uh, not just for electoral campaigns, but for labor campaigns for recruitment purposes. Um, when we have uh, any sort of event, you know, it takes effort to put on an event uh, for a campaign, uh, be it a phone bank or some sort of um, meet and greet. And when DSA members organize those events, those are skills that they can directly bring back to the chapter to uh, organize chapter events. Um, and so that's one thing uh, you'll get to do, you'll get practice with recruitment because we'll be out on the doors and people really respond to our message and you'll get to do a recruitment pitch 
or we'll just attract people from the neighborhoods uh, that are interested. They'll show up to our events and you'll get a chance to, you know, make the pitch for DSA to them. Um, so it's really great. It's been a great way to grow our chapter. It's been a great way to diversify our chapter as well as uh, an electoral campaign. I'll have more energy directed towards it. And so, you know, you just have a lot more organic reach because of an electoral campaign. Um, and so we're really, we're really trying to build our own, like, you know, uh, people say it differently in DSA, proto party, party surrogate, uh, pre party formation, whatever you want to call it, just like real our own electoral structure within our chapter. And uh, which leads me to another point, it's not just our chapter, it's uh, chapters in the region as well. We work closely with Tampa DSA, who's right across the bay from us. Uh, we also have started to work closely with uh, Polk DSA, which is a rural chapter um, that's between Tampa and Orlando. Uh, that's newly formed. We've started to have great relationships with them and Orlando DSA as well, uh, and UCF YDSA and USF YDSA. And so it's really helping, you know, um, bring our chapters closer together to have a shared goal um, between this and other things that we're doing. And uh, it's important, like was talked about earlier, to lean on these chapters for their resources. We're stronger together. Uh, and we should act like we are part of a national organization and not be insular, um, which also, you know, is uh, the fact that national DSAs endorse this campaign and their resources have been incredibly helpful to us. And that's even before um, the endorsement, because we were able to have our chapters access uh, things that uh, national has to offer, um, which I'm sure you all have experience with. And so the Campaign's great for, you know, recruiting people in the local area um, that are attracted to your message because of the reach of the campaign. Uh, it's great for spreading the word about DSA. There's a lot of people who just didn't know we existed and respond very positively to our message. Um, and so it's going really well for us so far. Uh, we have one opponent who um, just got in the race a couple months ago. Uh, last month, they did outraise us, but uh, we had 200, over 200 donations. We had over 200 more donations than they did. They only had like 30, uh, but they raised money from, you know, rich Republicans. So uh, not a surprise that they had more money than we did, but we're keeping it very competitive um, and we are on track to have everything that we need um, to compete right now. And so uh, it's going really well. We've already knocked um, the entire universe in the district one time. Um, we're, we're going through phone banking them now and we're starting to knock those doors again. Uh, and this is unheard of within uh, our city and pretty much the entire state of Florida. Um, basically no one canvases. It's pretty much whoever raises the most money gets the endorsements and sends out the most mailers wins. Um, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna compete with them financially and we're going to knock a ton of doors and we're going to bring in all of our community partners to get involved in this. And so uh, it's gonna be a different, a different kind of model and I'm really optimistic about it. And our chapter and this campaign is not just like about, you know, just getting one person elected. We're really building like the resources and infrastructure uh, and strategy to take it across the entire state of Florida. Uh, I think we do have unique conditions. We're in the South. We're in a pretty hostile state in the South. And so I'm really proud of what's going on. Um, I have just a couple other things I'll share with you quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, why DSA was mentioned as well. Uh, we attracted a lot of high school students to the campaign, um, or we have attracted a decent number of high school students. And we've signed up them to start YDSA chapters at their high schools. And so we're really excited about that. Um, we had a lot of YDSA activity going on before the pandemic. And after it hit, it kind of got sidetracked. But I'm really optimistic that it's going to get back on track uh, because of the people we've been able to connect with through the campaign. And uh, finally, I want to talk about, you know, something that I find the most important uh, as a union member um, and a former steward at my workplace and a delegate to the Labor Council. Um, we've been really trying to connect with labor. Uh, and so the campaign's been sending uh, people out to worker actions. We've had a good amount of worker activity uh, in the Tampa Bay area the last uh, few months. And so uh, every time something comes up, we try to go and like pause whatever we're doing with the campaign. Uh, we won't canvas for a day. We'll instead go out and support the workers um, at whatever they're doing, uh, make sure we use our resources to connect with them and just build stronger relationships with labor. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is using um, 
our connections to rank and file workers that uh, to build up, you know, different groups of workers like to support the campaign. So for instance, I'm a teacher. Um, we have a rank and file caucus in our local uh, union and we're getting uh, some of those members to, you know, push support, push the teachers union to help support the campaign, to help support some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, because the teachers union usually stays out of city elections because the city is controlled or the school districts controlled by the county and the state. And so uh, we try to go through the rank and file workers to try to change that to make our unions more of a, a fighting place and, and a campaign is a place where you can, you know, hone in and focus on it um, and say like, here's a direct ask uh, with a direct timeline that everybody can get involved in. Um, because, you know, this will be better for the students, this will be better for our uh, students, families, living conditions. And, uh, and I think that kind of just leads to what a what an electoral campaign is so good about is that it's something that like is very tangible, you know, it has an end date, it has like metrics, it needs to be hit. And often it can be find, hard to find work like that in a DSA chapter. And uh, that's what makes it so good. I mean, other than obviously like trying to capture a piece of the state and wield it in a socialist fashion, um, it's a really great thing to use for organizing. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, I'll, I'll leave time for questions so you don't just hear me ramble. I will drop like info about the campaign in the uh, chat, although I see people doing that already and I really appreciate it. Um, you can see like my website, Facebook and social media there. It's all all about the campaign. Um, you know, we're uh, in a fight right now. I feel really good about it, but um, it is a fight. We are going to have, you know, um, the capitalist class organized against us. Uh, and, uh, but I really think that, you know, this is going to be the first of many campaigns you'll see across the state. And uh, I know that's the case because I'm planning on, you know, supporting every single one after this and using all the knowledge we gain from this one to pass it off to the next. So, uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. We can, yeah, if you can type stack in the chat, if you have a question for Richie and um, I'll go first. Um, Richie, how can we support you? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to do it is like, you know, share our stuff on social media and donate. Like, uh, that is the absolute, like, easiest way you can go. I put it in there, richiefloyd.com and ship in like, five bucks, seven bucks, 27 bucks, whatever you can. Um, that'll help a lot. Uh, we have, you know, it's the end of the month. We have our fundraising deadline coming up. We have, again, a lot of small dollar donors, uh, but, you know, we're up against big money. So that's a big help. Um, another way is that we do have, um, we do have like virtual campaigning. Like we have phone banks uh, pretty much twice a week now. We just started phone banking uh, after, we had been canvassing for a long time to get petitions, but we're phone banking now. So like this Thursday, we've got a phone bank for at uh, six Eastern um, for just an hour and a half or so. And then like, I think Sunday night, we're doing them a couple times a week right now. So it'll probably be like once during the week, once on a weekend afternoon, um, you can come to a phone bank. We're gonna have text banks as time goes on as well. And if you follow uh, me on social media or you go to richiefloyd.com and fill out the volunteer form, um, I'll alert you to all of that. You can put in there like, yeah, you want to, you're, if you put in there like, yeah, I'm not in Florida, I'm in Texas, like then we'll put you on the phone bank or the text bank list. And that's what we'll tell you about. All right. Well, it looks like Ben has offered to match the first five people who donate $20 tonight. So uh, Kate has already taken him up on that. It's pretty awesome. Who else? I appreciate that so much. I see a question in the chat that says uh, virtual phone banks are through talk. We're doing virtual phone banks right now. They've been going really well um, and they're going fast enough, but we probably will get to through talk eventually. And yeah, I really appreciate that, Ben. I really appreciate, I see everybody in there. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's gonna make a huge difference for us um, getting support right at the uh, end of the month. Nice. Nice. Looks like Ben's got some matchers. <laughs> Y'all are awesome. All right. Um, looks like I don't see any other questions we've got coming in. Um, thank you so much for coming to speak, Richie. It's great to see you and hear from you on the campaign.
I'm wishing you the best of luck. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I uh, am done with calls today, so I'll, I'll hang out for a little bit. I, in, I see people saying things in the chat, so I'll grab the info that people put in there as well. I really appreciate the support. Um, and, you know, again, like, thank you for the work that y'all are doing as well, because like I said, it's been an inspiration to people across the South to see a chapter, you know, uh, doing, you know, as much as y'all are doing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. So next up, we've got the very important no on Prop B defund decrim campaign. Um, Grace or Seneca, are y'all ready to give us your update? Yeah. Seneca, if you want to, you're starting, right? Maybe. <laughs> Who's, who's starting? I can I can start. Yeah. Let me. Uh, I uh, I believe the order was you, then Preston, then me. Oh, okay. Well, let me share my screen. Oh, um, the order I, of slides well, I think has Seneca going over metrics first, but okay. Here we go. Well, I'll just I'll share do... my screen. Okay. okay. Uh, if that's the case. I'm sorry. I thought metrics were last. It's okay. Um, just a second. Okay. All right. Um, here we are with our update for home site handcuffs. Uh, the last day of early voting was today, and election day is Saturday. So, um, Seneca, do you want to talk through these metrics? Yeah, so, um, you know, our, our original win number was around 15,000, 15, right? Um, now, of course, the turnout has been increasing, which is good for us, uh, but does mean that we need more contact to be confident in our win. Um, so we have identified um, through the doors 12,674 folks. Um, through reach, another 1,452. Um, through um, a, a text bank that we had to bully the Travis County Democratic Party into doing. Uh, we got another 1648. Um, and then we have another ongoing text campaign right now and another 1500 um, for our initial text banks. Um, in addition, we have also been using our yard signs to trick people into giving us our information so that we can identify them as well. Um, so we've got um, another um, 1500 or so, or, or so, both through Texas Freedom Network and through our revolution. Um, so we're, we're getting up there, but let's maybe put things in, in context. So these are all people we've identified who we think are on our side. So the question is, are they voting? Now, the first day of early voting, we saw something super alarming, right? Normally in a May election like this, you're going to see somewhere uh, around three to four times the number of Democrats voting as Republicans. Um, and we only had about 20% more um, the first day, right? So um, this has basically been the Super Bowl for ghouls. Right? They have been waiting for two years to cast this vote, and Monday they came out in droves. Right, And this should be not surprising to anybody. Right, they, They're spending um, $1.25 million, and most of that is on paid ads, in addition to another $45,000 that Greg Abbott is personally taking in his campaign coffers in order to advertise the Republicans um, here in Austin. Um, so we have, you know, a broad swath of people who have been waiting for this vote and are really highly important, right? Um, but that means that those first day we had very old, very white people vote. Um, and that was really alarming, right? Um, if every day had looked like the first day, we would have lost hard. Things have been slowly improving since then. Um, the share of younger people has improved day to day. The share of women over men has improved day to day. Um, and the number of triple D voters versus triple R voters has improved day to day. Most importantly, though, our IDs are voting. So of the 60,000 people that have voted, 10,000 of them are people that we ID'd already, right? So that's a pretty good turnout number. Um, but there's more to do. And we're making new IDs every day. So it's very important. Oh, sorry. Um, way too much jargon. Um, a triple D is somebody who has voted in three consecutive Democratic primaries, right? Um, which means they're a reliable voter and they don't like switch parties back and forth a lot. And a triple R is somebody who has voted in three consecutive Republican primaries, right? So these are people who are partisans, right? Um, and it gives you like an idea of how to sample the electorate. Um, 
So the bottom line here is that we are within reach uh, because as the turnout is starting to increase, right? Yesterday, we had 15,000 people vote. Most of the days before that, um, we had had about 6,000 people vote. The number of people who are like not sociopaths <laughs> that are able to be found in the city outnumbers them, right? So the, the lower the voter total is, the better it is for Save Austin now. And so that increase in voter turnout gives us the fighting chance we need. But that means that the next three days are crucial. We have to make absolutely certain that Saturday's turnout is as insane as today's turnout. And to that effect, we are going to phone bank, text bank, and canvas every day from now until then. Um, Grace is going to go over some of the events here, but I want to highlight a few quick things. We now have, um, through the fundraising that we've done through the Homes Not Handcuffs Pack, which is founded by our own Heidi Sloan, raised over $150,000. Now that's a tenth of what Save Austin now has, but we've been spending it on things that actually work, right? So we've been hiring um, field, uh, field organizers. We've been printing lit for our canvassers. We've been getting dialers. And as a consequence, we're now in a position to have people knocking doors every single day, to be able to fill phone banks and to be able to have predictive dialers for each of those days. So what we need is to get people on those. So Grace is gonna go ahead and put some of the links up here in a second. What we need is for Saturday, tomorrow, Thursday and Friday to get at least 20 people on events, right? If we do that, we can successfully make another pass, an entire pass through our calling universe, right? Shaking the people who haven't called yet. We're gonna be taking out all the people who've already voted and getting them out, sounding the alarm right? Letting them know that this close, letting them know how much the most regressive forces in the city are spending to make sure that poverty becomes a crime in Austin. And this is a fight that is winnable, right? As this is trending, we are now within the numbers where we can win this, but we can lose it too. This will be a very close election on this. Um, I, I, looking at the other numbers, I, I think we're going to win on Prop F. Yay. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, the, this is something where they've turned an incredible amount of resources, but fortunately they've spent the overwhelming majority on it on paid media, right? Which is just reminding the ghouls that this race exists. Well, they already knew it existed, right? So they're setting some money on fire, which means that we are going to spend our money on directly contacting people and letting them know you personally have to vote. In particular, we're going to be canvassing the hell uh, and tabling the hell out of UT students because uh, our county commissioners saw fit to not give them a single polling location during early voting. Um, so we're gonna make sure that we get them to the Flawn Activity Center on Saturday and we get thousands of young people to vote. We're gonna call thousands of people the day of. Our revolution is gonna partner with us on Saturday and we're gonna call every Bernie voter who hasn't voted yet in Austin. And let me tell you, those are the easiest phone calls that we have ever made. You're calling Bernie voters and telling them not to uh, <laughs> throw poor people in jail. And it's also a great time to recruit people to DSA because lo and behold, it's only people who are not disgusted by the word democratic socialism. Um, so these events are gonna be incredibly crucial. Um, after this, we're gonna keep on fighting because we've now built up a set of data, right? Our, our previous work on the Austin Safer When Coalition gave us a per perfect profile of what a pro defund person looks like, which is why our time at the doors has been so easy. Uh, most of our canvassers have never talked to more than one pro prop B person in a single canvas. Uh, and there's a reason for that because we spent the time grinding in Austin to figure out where our base is. And we're gonna use the next stage of this campaign to make that even more precise. So that we run the next Jose Garza, the next Greg Kazar, we know exactly which doors to knock to make sure they win. All right, uh, up to uh, Preston, I believe you're next. Yep, I'll just be going over some of the more technical details, giving you some screenshots, snapshots of what the technical side of things look like. Uh, this first one is just Google Analytics, our website traffic. Um, the main takeaway here is 95% of the users in the past seven days are brand new. That is to say they've never been to the website before and they're seeing it for the first time and the average engagement of 30 seconds is great. That means we don't have 99% of people bouncing. Like they are at least reading the first couple sentences, which is crucial. 
Then we go to the next. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah, this is a 30 minute snapshot uh, of traffic from about three or four o'clock in the afternoon today. Uh, and it was about three or four times uh, higher than normal. Uh, the main thing here is that lots of folks are looking at Alvin's story. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Uh, decent amount of scrolling as well, which means there's some, you know, 36, 36 scroll events out of 63, like about half the people are at least going a little bit further down and, and looking. And most of this is on their mobile devices. So like, having a smooth mobile uh, experience has been crucial. I've, I've noticed in the data for getting commitments. Now I can go to the next one. <laughs> yeah, the next three, uh, Save Austin Now has definitely been uh, going crazy on paid advertising and I do that for a living and have for the past five years. So I've been throwing my own skill and some of my money around. And uh, this is just from today, looking at about a 6% click-through rate on Alvin's story. Uh, I'm not sure how many of y'all have seen it, but basically shot a video showcasing one person's experience with the camping ban and without it. And oh boy, does Google like to show that ad to pretty much everyone that Google's prop be. So you go to the next <laughs> slide, this is basically what you see. Mm -hmm. uh, all the keywords from today have been Prop B related, you know, about $1,000 or $2,000 as of now, actually, uh, on Prop B terms. Um, and I'm happy that uh, Google has shown this particular ad more than any of the others uh, on the bottom left, because uh, it gets it right there at the top. I watch off the story, vote no on B. You know, 5,000 people at least have read that. You know, 300 or so have clicked through and watched. So basically a decent number of the folks that are in the lines Googling last minute, what the heck is Prop B and all these signs about it? Like they are seeing our ads. They're also seeing SANS because if you go to the next slide, uh, SAN is doing their best to outbid us on top of page rate, which means they're paying a shit ton of money to be number one on Google for ad, for ad results on this. Uh, that's okay though, because one and two, and usually three are above the fold mobile device desktop, which means we're right below them. We pay significantly less money than they do. And for hey, today- Hey, sorry, Preston, y'all are running a little over on time. Can no, you sorry. get to the, the pitch? <laughs> yeah. <Thanks. laughs> yeah, the, the main thing here is uh, we are, you know, despite having less money, uh, we're significantly outdoing Sam on impression share. So that's the last of mine. All right. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to run through these real quick because I'm already on. So um, we've done a whole lot so far. Seneca went over some of that um, in the earlier slides. We've done a lot of events with our coalition partners. We've got paid staff knocking doors every day. We've been tabling and this has all been really successful, but we have a lot more work to do for the rest of the week. So um, this is going to be an uphill fight and it's really important that we make sure this proposition does not pass. Um, it is directly tied to our defund work. There's a huge reactionary backlash happening right now. There's these pro police groups that are forming. Um, and if this passes, it's going to be, um, you know, there'll be a lot of talking around. We need to fund the police so we can move people out. So let's not let it pass. Um, tomorrow we have a uh, canvas in Cherrywood. Um, in, in addition, every day this week, there's a phone bank and a text bank with Texas Freedom Network. Um, on Thursday, there's a phone bank with Texas Appleseed. I understand those are very good. And then Friday, we have a canvas at, um, in Dove Springs. So please turn up to those. On Saturday, we're going all out. Um, if somebody could drop the Homes Not Handcuffs events link in the chat, as well as the Google form, um, we need y'all to sign up to be poll greeters on Saturday. We're going to be doing vote tripling at the polls as people are leaving. We're going to say, hey, did you vote no on Prop B? Please go tell three of your friends right now in your neighborhood to come here and vote. So we're going to be focusing on these key polling places and, and do that vote tripling work. There's also a canvas with Texas Appleseed that day at 1130, a phone bank with Texas Freedom Network at 1130, and we're going to have our paid staff doing um, phone and text banking all day to make sure everyone we've ID'd gets out there and votes no on Prop B. Um, so that's what we've got. I'm going to stop sharing so we can move along with the meeting and we'll make sure everyone gets those links. Thank you.
Thanks, y'all. Um, next up, we have Greg with the Labor Branch update. Very exciting stuff. Hey, everybody. I didn't make slides. Um, sorry about that. Um, I also got kind of thrown into this. So um, last minute, Paul is not feeling well. So get better, Paul. Um, and I'm a little bit winging it, but I'll kind of let you know where we're at with the PRO Act. Um, so DSA, as you, as many of us know, has done an incredible job of um, phone banking senators in key states um, in order to pass the PRO Act, um, which is necessary in order for us to build worker power in this country, to build back the strength of our unions and to win um, transformative uh, change in this country, including a Green New Deal. Um, and um, to date, last I checked, we've made 650,000 calls, which is just um, an astounding number. And we have flipped a number of senators um, who explicitly um, said that they would be signing on to the PRO Act because of phone calls that their constituents have made to them, um, which uh, was clearly um, caused by DSA, which is, um, it's a huge flex for us. It shows us the power that we have. Um, we're closing on 100,000 members and the fact that we can make um, 650,000 calls in one month and flip senators um, to an actually transformative bill is um, something beautiful, something that we love to see. Um, so there's a few holdouts um, and we're gonna, we're gonna get them too. Um, as we know, um, this weekend is May 1st, May Day, which is an international workers holiday, um, which was started in America, but um, isn't celebrated as a national holiday because our bosses are afraid of us. Um, and we're going to change that this year. There are going to be rallies head, held by DSA chapters in over 60 cities um, in America, and ours is going to be among those that um, kick the most ass. Um, we are going to have speakers from unions um, across Austin, um, it's going to be a who's who of the labor community in our city. Um, we've done a great job of um, co making coalitions with um, different unions who are sending speakers. Um, we've uh, AFL-CIO is turning out their members. The Central Labor uh, Council is turning out their members. Um, we've talked to TSEU. We've talked to IATSE. We've talked to um, We've talked to IBW, AFSCME. Um, I'm missing a bunch, but they're like I said, all of our um, all of our local labor leaders are going to be there and show a force um, in order to uh, get this thing home. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's going to be on May second. Obviously, as we all know, we have a big, important election on May first, so we didn't want to interfere with that. We want everybody be, to turn out to the polls and vote no on Prop B. Um, and then the next day, we want you all to turn out to the Capitol at two p.m. That's Sunday, May second. Um, we need a Green New Deal. We need to solve our climate crisis, our economic crisis. Um, in order to win that New Deal, we're going to need mass worker power and. Um, to build mass worker power, we need to pass the PRO Act and we need our labor movement to, um, to build its strength and push this thing home. Um, let's go, pass the PRO Act, baby. Yes, awesome. <laughs> let's go. Um, okay, next up we have Dave with the update from the National Political Committee. What's going on over there? What is the National Political Committee? Oh, what indeed. Thanks y'all for the great update on the Pro Act campaign. Hi everybody, um, Dave Pinkham, uh, he, him, um, member of Boston DSA and currently for a few more months, uh, also a member of DSA's National Political Committee, which is uh, elected leadership of our organization that helps to 
steer what we're doing uh, in between our conventions, which happen every two years, which are the highest decision making body of DSA, where delegates from all over the country come together and make decisions about what our organization is about. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just going to give a quick little pump up for the convention, uh, which is happening this year. Uh, it's going to be uh, about three months from now, and there's a lot of things going on between now and then. Um, as a member of the NPC, one of the main things that I've been working on uh, for the past few months around the convention is um, uh, working on the committee to uh, help build and build participation in the process for DSA to adopt our first organizational platform. Um, throughout history, socialist parties have always adopted democratic, democratically adopted platforms, both to reach uh, sort of internal unity about what we stand for, what we're fighting for, and also uh, very helpfully uh, as a way to create propaganda for why uh, other working class people who are not already socialists might want to join our socialist organization. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we're doing in this convention is building that process. Um, a draft of the platform has been sent out <clears throat> uh, and, you know, there's going to be an ongoing process of feedback and solicitation, discussion, amendment, amendments, and then ultimately it's going to, you know, culminate at the convention. Um, so I see that someone has shared the overall convention website already, which I was going to do, which is great. If you go to that site, you can find out what's going on. Uh, it'll have relevant dates. Uh, the, the sort of next things that are coming up are going to be a series of pre-convention conferences, uh, which is where you and members of DSA all over the country can get together and talk about this stuff. These pre-convention conferences are going to be really focused on the platform. So if you want to get together with other DSA members, and talk about why a socialist organization should have a political platform uh, and what we can do with that and also what should be in it, that's the place to go. Um, the link for that is on that website, uh, but I'll directly share that as well. Um, there are five dates and they're listed on this page on this Airtable form that I just uh, <coughs> dropped there. Um, there all of them are open to everybody. They're, they are spaced out by time zones to make sure as many people can get involved, you know, can participate as possible. But go ahead and sign up for one of those. Um, should be a lot of fun, especially if you like to talk about why we're doing what we're doing. Um, another big thing, which uh, Anna already shared in the chat, but today is the day for if you want to run as a delegate uh, to represent Austin DSA at the convention, today is the day to sign up. It's the deadline. You got to do it now. Um, really encourage y'all to do that. Uh, there will be elections, obviously, in the chapter to select those delegates. Uh, I've been a delegate from, for Austin DSA for the last two conventions. I gotta say, like, it's been a great experience every time. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're not doing it in person this time because of COVID. So there's not gonna be quite as much opportunity to meet in, you know, comrades from all over the country and get to build relationships. But um, you know, in the planning of the convention, we're doing the best that we can to try to facilitate that space, even through online, uh, you know, Zoom and et cetera, so that people can uh, can still build those relationships. Um, going to the 2017 DSA convention, which I was still newish to DSA at that time, was a really, really formative and, you know, I would say like transformative, transformative experience for me. So I really recommend uh, considering participating. And this time you, you don't even have to travel anywhere. Um, so I've mentioned the platform, I've mentioned the upcoming uh, uh, pre-convention conferences. One other thing that like I wanna share with y'all and it is also on this page, but I'm gonna share it directly again, uh, is if you wanna know what is happening with the convention, we have created a, a special email list that you can only, that you can join by, you know, by choice, just to, we're trying to keep overall emails down to everybody. Uh, but if you would like to get informed about everything that's happening related to the convention and all the different deadlines, events, and ways to get plugged in, you can sign up for that email list and you'll get regular updates on that. Um, so I think that's 
all I have to say offhand, uh, unless I, you know, I don't know about time, but if anyone has any questions and there's time, I'd be happy to answer them. Dave, <clears throat> did y'all get good feedback? Did you, have y'all started looking through the feedback at all? What's going to happen with um, for the platform? Yeah, we got a decent amount. So the first phase, I, I guess I was a little vague on this first phase was like sort of informal feedback where we basically asked people kind of like, you know, their general thoughts or feelings about the different planks of the platform. Um, and also offer an opportunity for people to, you know, offer their opinions on them. We haven't really sorted through all that stuff. There are many hundreds of responses. Um, but that's going to be kind of the task of the convention and resolution. I mean, the platform and resolutions committee for the next couple of weeks to sort through that stuff and figure out how we're going to incorporate feedback. Hey, Dave. Yeah. The convention, like the NPC advertised convention is like a week long. Should that stop people here from applying to be a delegate to the convention? Or oh. is there something else we should know about that schedule? I feel like that was like a setup. Somebody who put who put it up to that? Um, no, so the convention is advertised as a week long and we did that partially because we're doing it online. Uh, we wanna offer people you know, an opportunity to get to participate in a lot of stuff. Most of the stuff in the earlier part of the week is, or all of the stuff in the earlier part of the week is all going to be like optional sessions, uh, like on organizing and like sort of free, free, you know, free time for like different committees and caucuses and whatnot in DSA to basically have events that people can join. Thursday night is when the actual deliberation starts. So if you're concerned that you can't participate every night all week, I totally understand. Um, I don't know if I will be participating every night all week. So Thursday, Friday, sat the Saturday, Sunday are going to be the time where the formal discussion uh, amendments and voting is going to happen. All right. Thank you, Dave. Um, <clears throat> next up, we have a bittersweet <laughs> Um, presentation. Um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Maddie and Ash Khan, our beloved comrades and leaders of Austin DSA at various times in our history, are moving to New York to become rank and file teachers. So, uh, Maddie and Ash Khan, over to you. Thanks, Leah. Thanks for asking us to talk about the rank and file strategy a little bit. I'm Ash Khan. Hey, I'm Madeline. Um, we're also going to, if I'm not mistaken, uh, have a more in-depth discussion about the rank and file strategy at tomorrow's Red Square. Um, so y'all can come to that too, or tell people to come to that if you're interested to talk about this more. Um, but basically, I'll put it like this. I'm going to explain a little bit about the rank and file strategy. Um, and then Madeline's going to talk about kind of like what she went through as a socialist and how she decided to become a teacher and all that. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much how it's gonna go. And then if there are questions or anything, we're super happy to talk either now or later as well. We'll put our contact information in the chat. So um, basically a socialist has to be concerned with two things strategically, uh, two main things in society. There's like the state, you know, like government. And then from there we have like, state theory and like electoral strategy and all those and the kind of campaigns we run and all those kinds of things. Um, but that's not enough for us to focus on if we want to build a socialist society, if you want to end capitalist exploitation, there's there's where that where our power actually comes from, from our perspective, which is in the uh, working class, which is in the rank and file members of the organized labor movement, for example, um, the, the, the workers who um, in our society actually make society run. Um, and since they make society run, they can make it stop, right? This, this is kind of like socialism 101. Um, and we're at a point in the history, and we're at a point in the like development of the socialist movement and the labor movement where there's a lot of signs of promise, like clearly um, in under the right circumstances, a lot of people can be brought onto our side. Think of the tens of millions of people that were politically activated by Bernie Sanders. Um, but at the same time, we're still very far from where we want to be. The world that exists today is not created in our image. Uh, just to pick one example of an infinite number, look at what's happening with vaccine rollouts across the world and how like Bill Gates is determining 
uh, like that uh, millions of people in India or whatever are going to get COVID, um, just arbit not arbitrarily, but because of profit. Okay, anyway, um, the organized working class can stop that. And so the rank and file strategy is a strategy to uh, revitalize the labor movement, build a democratic, that means a labor movement that's uh, led by not just uh, the leadership, but by every rank and file worker who feels like they are a political agent as well. Um, and if you look at the history of uh, class struggles and of labor struggles and that sort of thing, then um, there's always been what's what you'll find called a militant minority. This is in the articles and the agenda, a militant minority of workers who um, some of whom are socialists and some of whom are not, but who are committed to building a democratic bottom-up uh, rank and file movement that can that can win, yes, better wages and working conditions today, but that can also kind of like overcome capitalist exploitation by uniting the working class as a class. Okay, if, 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 if some of that went over your head, then I definitely encourage you to read the articles. I encourage you to read the articles anyway about learning more about the rank and file strategy. Um, but the idea is basically that there's a labor movement and a socialist movement and they've got, they need each other. We need each other in order to win, right? So the labor movement has to be strong, but it also has to have like a socialist outlook. And part of that, one tactic in the rank and file strategy is socialists getting strategic jobs in the labor movement. Uh, you can think to yourself what some, what some, and you can say in the chat maybe, what some strategic parts of the working class are. For a long time, it was, uh, you'll hear the industrial proletariat, factory workers. Um, that's still kind of an important part of the economy, but um, there's more than that. I'm seeing some good answers in the chat. Yeah, eds, meds, <laughs> logistics. Um, you know, the pandemic really uncovered a lot of uh, the kinds of jobs that actually make society run. I mean, grocery store workers was not on anyone's mind in terms of the forefront of society, but that really seems to be it too. Um, and so, yeah. Um, Madeline and I are becoming teachers and she's gonna talk about kind of like her personal journey and how she got there. And then tomorrow I'll talk about mine at Red Square if you really wanna know. <laughs> um, yeah, thank, and good, glad to see so many comrades on the call tonight. Um, uh, yeah, I know, I know a lot of you guys personally and I know that a lot of you have really amazing and uh, cool and impactful jobs and stuff. Um, but I know that my journey has not been so my journey to like figure out how to like have an income and like have time to do socialism has not always been that straightforward and easy. Um, so yeah, I've just, I've just always been uh, one of those people that never really knew the answer to that question of like, what do I want to do when I grow up kind of thing. And uh, from a young age, I was always pretty sure that like I vaguely wanted to, you know, do something good. I was like a Girl Scout. I was like, I need to make a difference in the world. I need to leave it a better place than I found it. And so I was a chemical engineer like my freshman year at UT. And I was really surprised to discover that like everyone I was meeting was like, I want to make a ton of money in the oil and gas industry. I was like, what? Um, Because I, I didn't grow up with like money like my parents didn't make a lot of money but for some reason I was just like there's got to be plenty of jobs out there right that are like good and like changing the world but like pay a decent living and so yeah when I graduated as um, I'm sure lots of you guys know um, that kind of thing was pretty shattered when you actually start applying for jobs and realizing realize that it's really hard to find a job and it's especially hard to find a job that like pays enough to like even be able to afford much after like rent and stuff like that. Um, so uh, yeah, I bounced around for a while, like, you know, finding various like science jobs and stuff. And, um, but eventually I was like, okay, I probably need to like put together some sort of plan to like, you know, have a real career. And, um, and then, so in my like, journey to find some sort of like environmental engineering career I uh stopped by work or I worked at the state for a minute doing like drinking water quality across the state and I learned pretty uh firsthand um that the realities of resource management and environmental enforcement in the state and as many of you socialists probably already have an inclination like uh 
yeah, it's all very profit driven. And it turns out there's a lot of very poor drinking water quality like throughout the state, especially in rural areas. There's water that um, long-term consumption of will probably likely maybe give you cancer. And that's really messed up. And you talk to these like rural water system owner or runner, people who run rural water systems and it's not like they're evil people. They just don't have the funding or technical expertise to provide, you know, basic access to drinking water to the people that live there. And then I joined, uh, or then I started graduate school and um, around the same time, I finally, you know, discovered what this whole socialism thing was and it kind of confirmed a lot of the things I'd already been working on, uh, <laughs> like leaning towards my whole life. Um, it all started to make sense. The world is run for profit, that kind of thing. Um, and so I started graduate school and I told all of these professors like, hey, I really wanna like, you know, make a career off of, uh, you know, fighting the whole profit model. And they're like, you're uh, not going to make it. <laughs> like, they didn't wanna give me money to like fight the profit model in like um, environmental enforcement. Um, so yeah, I was pretty open to finding an alternative to, the kind of career I was looking for when I found out about comrades seeking out teaching careers. And when I found out about this very cool entry way into public school teaching in New York City, um, which is, you know, one of the largest teaching locals in the country, uh, union locals, I was like, yeah, that seems like a great way to apply my like interest in math and science and engineering to actually be able to do this whole like fight the profit model thing. And around the same time, I was also learning about the New Deal and how, you know, these huge labor battles were fought to actually win uh, monumental um, programs for working class people and how we need to do exactly that kind of thing to win a Green New Deal if we hope to have any kind of progress on our environmental issues. And so, yeah, it all made sense to, you know, put some of my training and interests into, yeah, building rank and file democracy in one of the most um, exciting and uh, large unions in the country in one of the, you know, most, or in one of the like most uh, capitalistic kind of beating hearts of capital kind of places in the world. Um, so, that's kind of my story and how I've gotten here. And we're really excited to launch into it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I can add a little bit to that, um, which is that like being in DSA has been incredible, right? It's a place where someone who is like, you know, I discovered socialism, uh, not like on my own, but like isolated, right? Like I watched Bernie on TV and like found clips of Richard Wolf explaining surplus value on Facebook, if anyone has gone through that process. Ben is nodding, it's good stuff. Um, there's like a 10 minute video on Facebook and I was like, yeah, I'm watching this. And by the end of it, I was like, okay, I'm a Marxist. Anyway, um, and so that's really exciting. And like I joined DSA and I was like, okay, great. Here is where we can actually build socialism. I see the like problems that like profit and capital is causing. Um, and at least together we can all organize. And there were hundreds of people in the DSA chapter even when I joined. Um, and that's all great, but the problem is, is that it's not enough, um, because, you know, a lot of what we do in DSA is education, which is critical and with, and, um, and, and kind of like more advocacy and mobilizing. Um, and we do do some organizing as well. Um, but as socialists, we know where power actually lies in society and that's in the organized working class. And in DSA, what we do is give a political expression to the entire class, right? Like um, what I'm saying is like, if you are in a union, then um, you could imagine that your political goals might line up very specifically like with your, with your job, with like the interests of, for example, if you are in a, if you are a minor, your short-term political interests may not be for uh, sustainable energy goals, right? Um, However, the role of socialists and the role of DSA is to give expression to that class-wide interest, 
that every working class person has the same long-term interests um, against the capitalist class uh, as a whole. Okay, so that's DSA. However, that DSA is still not the labor movement. DSA is still not where the actual levers of power can be pulled. And so that's why it's imperative that as the socialist movement grows, uh, we focus our attention on the labor movement. That means doing stuff like organizing for the PRO Act. Like that's all, that's all wonderful. But there are a lot of us who also can embed ourselves in the labor movement. I mean, and you don't even, I mean, like we're moving, okay? But that's because, you know, the personal reasons too. Um, there are comrades in Austin DSA who have gotten jobs as electricians in IBEW, the electricians union. In fact, I worked in um, the Austin public school system as a teaching assistant, thanks to the like support and education that I got, excuse me, in Austin DSA. Um, the toughest thing about that was that was that I wasn't connected with other DSA members at the time, but now we have more DSA members in this chapter who are teachers, who are nurses, who are, um, who are like I said, electricians. We have a lot of members. This is the capital of the state, so there are a lot of like state jobs and that, that sort of thing. We have a lot of members in the, and AFSCME, as Trish is saying in the chat, the, the union for state and county and municipal workers. Um, from like from here, organized workers can really make a difference and not just like advocating for a given policy, but, and this is very difficult to imagine in Texas, I know, but strikes can happen, right? Strikes can happen that have happened across the country in recent years. There's been another explosion, right? Of teacher strikes that are really giving hope to working class people, I think, and especially as socialists. I mean, like, really giving hope to us, but are also scaring the ruling class. When the strike wave happened in 2018, tech, the Texas state legislature immediately just gave teachers the biggest raise they had gotten in a decade because they were just afraid of even the threat of teachers organizing uh, toward some kind of militant action. And so we're still in the SA. <laughs> and I know that the comrades who have joined, for example, IBW and AFSCME and gotten jobs there are still in DSA. And that's very important. Political organizing is critical. It's necessary. Um, but it's also insufficient for socialism. We're going to have to have a working class that is organized and sees its own power and is on fire about it. If we really want to do away with the extremely uh, avoidable, unnecessary, but really tragic uh, problems in our society today, which we are all far too aware of. Um, okay, so we could talk about this for a long time. And if other people want to talk about it, that's what Red Square Tomorrow is for. We'll give like a short, shorter presentation for those who couldn't make it here. And I'd really recommend um, comrades join us there. But I guess, Leah, if we have a couple minutes, I haven't been eyeing the chat, although people are saying very nice things. Um, I haven't seen everything. Are there any like kind of big picture questions we can answer? Well, I, I saw that Kate said something about um, love all our members who have chosen to become union teachers and union IBWs here workers. Or okay, that just reminded me. I guess not exactly what I thought it said, but it reminded me that yeah, like a, it's cool to be part of a wave of people who are jumping into these different careers that we might not have thought ourselves. Um, but yeah, jumping in new careers and like we can all support each other. Like I currently know uh, comrades who are uh, studying to become nurses now and um, you know, we're studying to become teachers and we're all going to have a lot of homework and a lot of, <laughs> it's gonna be, you know, a bumpy ride for a while until we all get our footing. And it's, it's cool to be part of a wave of organized socialists that are actually, you know, jumping into this together. And yeah, and I'll say something else too, which is that like, um, this like building socialism is a long process. Okay, we're gonna be very lucky to have uh, any kind of like uh, major American welfare state in our lifetimes. But that, 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 that kind of thing is possible with the kind of organizing that we're seeing in DSA uh, and in the labor movement starting to just like happen um, again. So it's a long process, but we're not going on some great sacrifice. Neither of us have made uh, uh, as much money as we're going to make in our first year in our new jobs. <laughs> Um, a, a, a one job that's really important for the economy is uh, legit or one sector is logistics. And we have we know comrades who are UPS workers 
where you know the, the truck drivers after four or five years make up to a hundred thousand dollars or not up to i mean they make a hundred thousand dollars they get to retire at like 55 with uh generous pensions because they're in strong union jobs <laughs> which they're trying which they're seeking to make even better union jobs and democratizing their unions so what i'm trying to say is the long process it's not necessarily a sacrifice in the sense of like you're committing yourself to a life of destitution. You know what I mean, like, uh, you know, elect electricians make a living wage even in Austin and they, and they can only get better through their organizing. People should look at Dave and Heidi's background, the IBEW logo. Um, <laughs> even in Austin where the union density is not as high as it is in other cities, right? Um, and so that's a really important part. Uh, and then the other thing is too, just like, you know, socialists need jobs. And so I, after a couple of years in DSA, I was giving it my all and spending all my time in DSA, but like, I felt still like I could have been doing more and I felt kind of like unfulfilled and I wasn't sure why. Um, and it was, and I, it took me a while, but it realized I still had like, kind of like a liberal conception of what it was to be a worker in a sense. Like I thought, kind of like Maddie was saying, oh, I'm going to work for like, I worked for like some nonprofits and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm going to make the world better in that way. Um, and I was wrong, I think, because uh, you, making the world better uh, matters, matters very little if there isn't socialism. If, you know, the kind of gains that people make can be rolled back immediately at the whims of the ruling class. But when workers run society, when the working class is in charge of society, then we're really talking about uh, permanently building the kind of world that we all deserve today and that hopefully our offspring will see tomorrow, you know? Um, so... Yeah, I, th I think people should uh, think, you know, you should think to yourself, not necessarily tonight, but, you know, think to yourself, um, what does it take to build socialism? Where am I in my job or whatever? Um, is, it, is, it, is it possible for me to, not even just on my own, but with other people, work to get um, a job in an important union here? I think that's like, you know, it sounds like a big deal, but like, I mean... We're doing it. You know, there are people on the, I see multiple people on my screen, not even the whole call that have done it. Um, and that's just another part of what it's going to take. So unions are good, but they'll be even better when they're red unions, when they're uh, democratically led by the rank and file. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, Leah. Thanks for having us on this call. And I just want to say like, uh, I served on this, we're moving. So like I served on this leadership committee for three years, Maddie served on it for two years. Um, and it's just incredible to see that like in, you know, red Texas where no one expects it, or even in like liberal Austin where they kind of thumb their noses at us or whatever, or you know what I mean? Um, we're building a socialist institution where working class people can join and undergo political education and learn how to be socialist organizers. And that's incredible. We need to be that factory for socialists that produce people like, or produce good comrades like Leah and Maddie and Heidi and Dave and everyone else on this call. Um, and yeah, that's just wonderful. Let's all commit ourselves to building the socialist movement for the rest of our lives. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks y'all, I love you. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone here knows like Maddie and Ashcon have been a huge part of building this chapter. We're really important to me and helping me figure out Austin DSA. We love you all a lot. We're going to miss you, but we're very excited you're building socialism for the rest of your life <laughs> and potentially recruiting many of us to this New York City fellowship. <clears throat> um, all right. 